What's up, everybody? Welcome to Woman in Hip Hop Podcast. I'm your host, Jazzy Bell, and today we have an amazing show. She actually is kicking off my whole Women's Month because I'm revamping Woman in Hip Hop. As you know, it was a little bit of a break. That's because, you know, the site needed a bit of a um, redesign, darling. <laughs> so I'm very happy to have one of my first guests. She is a writer extraordinaire. You know, you've probably seen her work in XXL. Oh my God, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, um, when she did the Beyonce cover, which was amazing. Vibe, of course, you know, that's the hometown right here, Billboard. And she just co-wrote Black is King with the Beyonce, working with her once again. We are here with the one and only Clover Hope. How are you, lovely? Hi, I am good. I'm, that was an amazing intro. And I have, yes, in my book, <laughs> The Mother Load. Um, 100 plus women who made hip hop. Um, so that's like the latest thing. That is the latest thing. Sorry, I missed that, but I definitely ain't gonna miss it in the interview because that's really the reason why I wanted to interview you today is to get into the book that I ordered today. It will be here tomorrow. However, that's all right because I might want to have you back on the show because I hear it may be a little part two to the book anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, yeah. <laughs> we'll get right to it. Um, first and foremost, with you being this amazing writer, especially as a Black woman, I know there's a lot of people that looking up to you and they really want to know your journey and your backstory. So please share with us here in Women in Hip Hop. What made you want to become a writer? I mean, first and foremost, it was really storytelling. And I know that's kind of, uh, you know, like a thing a lot of storytellers say, but it really is, you know, I was really engrossed in just fiction and creating worlds when I was younger. I was always reading young adult novels. I was reading, you know, um, like waiting to exhale in my bedroom, you know, like when it came out. And I was kind of always interested in like the way that um, you know, like you could create a world through just, through storytelling, through like writing, and you could kind of like escape and you know really um, relate to people like on a level um, outside of yourself. And you know, I, I really love that through writing I could you know uh, speak for myself in a way that I didn't maybe verbally. You know, I was a really quiet kid, and um, through writing I could kind of also express, um, you know, like my interests, whether it was like music, hip hop, um, culture, you know, like we, you know, a lot of us get into hip hop like as teenagers because that's when we're, you know, like really discovering ourselves and kind of figuring out what we want to, what we want to be or like what we, um, you know, what we want to kind of like put out in the world. And so that was around the time when I discovered both writing and hip hop, you know, like as a teenager, I kind of just, you know, got, I was like writing like corny poetry, like in my little like poem book. And I was also like writing down like hip hop lyrics. Like I would write down lyrics, like, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony, like Crossroads. I was trying to like memorize it. And I was trying to kind of memorize like Left Eye's verse on Waterfalls. Like I remember writing that, like, you know, listening, like writing, I don't know why I'm doing this. <laughs> like, <laughs> what is it? Like headphones, yeah. listening, <laughs> writing down, um, you know, rewind, listen again. Like I would rewind the songs and like write down the lyrics. Cause it was, you know, before the genius.com or even before like Ola, came about and I was like all over Ola but um or Ula yeah the lyric site and so you know I kind of through that avenue I was kind of always um you know expressing creativity but I didn't really you know discover it as a profession until I like started reading Vibe magazine and I realized you know that could be a job um I saw Moesha doing it and I was like okay this could be something and um you know like I kind of just you know once I got to college, realized that I could turn it into like a profession and write and like make money um, off of it. And, you know, it, but I really did kind of like fall into it basically, you know. It kind of reminds me of just my coming of age story as far as falling in love with hip hop. Cause people are like, where did this love come from? Like, why do you have a podcast called Moment of Hip Hop? And I, and that's why, again, I wanted to interview you because I feel like it's just so relatable. Like you can understand my love for the women in the culture. Cause don't you feel like it helped raise you in a sense? Mm -hmm. is what it sounds yeah. like, you know? Like, did you, did you watch Brown Sugar? Oh, I feel like that's like a reference for like any, you know, like she was, you know, Sonali Thin played the, you know, character, the main character 
and she was like editor-in-chief of double xl magazine so i would you know like i love that movie um like i would watch you know like moesha had an internship at vibe you know so yeah. those were kind of images that we saw that you know i know for me like i didn't realize it was kind of making me um you know like kind of nurturing me like seeing an image of like a black girl like a black woman young black woman kind of you know working and doing you know something that she was passionate about um because i was you know looking at jobs and I don't know, I was like accounting or like kind of like more technical a little bit. Um, but then I just started, I was like, I'm a creative person. Like I need to like really like kind of um, get that out. And so, yeah, it is, it is, um, I think it did, um, you know, like there's this weird place with us with hip hop because we love it so much. And it's so, um, you know, especially like the women doing it. Um, and then there's this like push against us though at the same time where it's, you know, the, you know, this, the language or kind of, you know, um, imagery that we're like, we can't get fully on board with or like depictions that are kind of violent or whatever towards women. So, you know, it's kind of constantly, it feels like it's constantly kind of like attacking us as we're kind of like embracing it. And that's the weird relationship that we have with it. Cause it's so much like we love this, you know, culture that's made by, made by us and like, um, you know, like black boys who are trying to kind of get out of the system or whatever, or like talking, rapping about the system. And at the same time, it's like that, you know, you know, <laughs> like that hard part of it is, you know, you gotta, that, you know, it's just tough to be in that. I know right? what you're saying, absolutely. Um, yeah. I love you said brown sugar, because it's funny, I was gonna start off this interview like, so when did you first fall in love with hip hop? <laughs> we'll get right. to that later. <laughs> but as far as your writing, and you said once you went to college and that's when you knew, and especially looking at Vibe, that's when you knew that this is what you wanted to do. What was your first piece that you read? Um, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I, um, well, some of the first pieces that I got assigned were when I was interning at Vibe. And I was, I remember like talking to Keisha Cole <laughs> about like her tattoos. It was probably, it was actually probably the first interview I like celebrity interview that I did. And I was so nervous. I was like, I prepped my questions. I was like sitting at my little desk and I was like, <laughs> and it was hard. Cause you know, she's not like a super, she doesn't love doing press. And no. so for that to be like, <laughs> <Been there. laughs> right. Like this quiet girl trying to get something out of Keisha Cole about her tattoos. It was like, it was definitely, uh, this is what the job is, you know, kind of situation. So that was one of um, the first pieces I did. And I would do like little, um, you know, like interviews for Vibe. Uh, I think I did one with like Tiara Marie early on when, and cause they would for the magazine have these, you know, fun sections where it was, you know, talking about lifestyle and like what people, you know, like what products they were buying and things like that. So I would basically be interviewing artists for that, um, for that section. Um, and the first, but one of the first kind of um, like hip hop related pieces I did also when I was, you know, early 20s, like trying to just like get, uh, you know, like get any type of writing out was actually Roxanne Chante. <laughs> and I interviewed her in Queens when she had opened her ice cream shop, um, which, you know, I guess a lot of people don't know about, but she opened this ice cream shop and it was like just a fun kind of, I was young and kind of like, oh my God, I'm interviewing like Roxanne Chante. And like, I didn't even you know, I, I was, um, she wasn't one of the artists that I was listening to, like, a, a whole lot, like, growing up. It, like, I was more so, like, the um, Saw and Peppa, Lil' Kim era, uh, Missy Elliott, like, those were kind of my first, um, the first rappers that I kind of, like, fell in love with, and, um, you know, but that was a great lesson for me at that age. Like, I learned about, like, her, uh, you know, like, her history and, like, her, um, like, you know, position in hip hop and like uh, her creation of hip hop. So um, it was nice to get that, like a story like that in early. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I need to find it. I need to like find yeah. it. It was for, and it was for Mugshot Magazine, which was, <laughs> is that now defunct? But it was, that was like a kind of, I think local hip hop magazine. You know, there are a lot of music magazines and now it's it's like not as, you know, like it's it's hard to find like, up in print but yeah yeah
You know what I want to ask you? Because you mentioned some of the dope women that you interviewed from Keisha Cole to Roxanne Chate and all of that. Um, and you know, in hip hop, you know, one of the things that, oh, I just had a debate about this on how people are like, you know, well, she didn't write her stuff and, you know, Biggie did mm -hmm. this and et cetera. And I just feel right. like when I have these conversations with these men, they're very shocked on my knowledge of hip hop mm -hmm. from outside of women. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know this, I'm part of this culture, but it seems, you know, it always be a question. It's like a dark cloud hovering over my knowledge of that. As a writer mm -hmm. in hip hop, as a woman in hip hop, do you feel that you're, you're treated that way just like how the women are treated in our female rappers? Right, and that's, um, it's funny, like the similarity between just kind of covering it and then like also, you know, being an artist within it, like we're, we kind of operate in the same space. It's all like the music industry. So um, like I definitely felt, um, felt that from the industry side, like the artists um, less than, you know, like peers, like, you know, the, the, the young men and like kind of like my bosses and people I work with, like those were kind of like nurturing environments and Good. it did feel, um, you know, like actually, uh, like I was learning a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when I get to like interviewing the artists, it's kind of like, okay, this is <laughs> <What's> <laughs> like, <she? laughs> yeah, it, it literally like I put that at the end of my introduction in the book, which is like nice for a girl. Um, like I just kind of like cite uh, a moment interviewing Ludacris in Atlanta and, you know, we're talking about, uh, it was for a cover story for XXL and, um, at his restaurant and like I had, you know, flown out there and, you know, we're talking about his, you know, uh, his movie, um, crossover and him kind of more becoming more of a film star and I could see him kind of like looking at me like, uh, just give you know, like the whole time it was just like, I mean, I look young, I guess, you know, I, at that time I was like, what mid 20s or something um you know and he was just by the end of it he was like you know I really was you know like admittedly I was like questioning your uh like your hip-hop knowledge or whatever like in the beginning and then the more I spoke to you like I realized like you know your stuff or like you're like you know you're, like you're a hip-hop head or whatever um so I included that anecdote in the book because I felt like it is you know reflective of you know our role in this uh industry where it is you know it's the voices are primarily men controlling um you know messaging and things like that so i i had that experience or it would be like me kind of interviewing lil wayne on his tour bus that was another cover story that i did for xxl and he just kept calling me like darling and it was just like this, you know, it's kind of things like that. Like, I'm sure you get that too, where it's, it's like you're on a, oh, oh okay, sweetie. <laughs> you know, like, what do you know or whatever. And like, that's like, you just get that from like the artists who are looking at you like, oh, what are you, oh, <laughs> like challenging your kind of knowledge of hip hop. And, you know, if you don't know stats, then it's like, oh, what do you know? But, it's, you know, hip hop is not, all about knowing like stats or like who sold this or whatever like it's you know like we know it's like deeper than that absolutely how did you handle that though being you know talk <laughs> in a condescending way or being doubted as far as your love and knowledge for hip-hop how did you deal with that um i think i tried to just brush it off and be like professional like in the moment like i'm sitting across from him and um, you know for the little lane example mm -hmm. um I'm sitting across from him and I'm just like, <laughs> you know, please stop. You know, sometimes I'll be like, please don't, you know. Okay, come on, tell us. But, but that, I don't think I did because I was just like, I, like, and it made it into the story. Like it's, it's online, um, you know, like the whenever he would call me like darling or whatever. And it was that, you know, I would, I would pretty much just brush it off. And, you know, there's some things we, you know, either you, you know, if it, if it feels like I need to like say something, it's, I'll, I'll just mention like, you know, it seems like you're being a little bit uh, <laughs> something, you know, um, but in that case, I just kind of, you know, sometimes when I, like when I was young and just trying to kind of get the job done, get I it, get over it. Yeah. I think yeah. I asked you that because I know a lot of women, including myself, um, sometimes, especially in a male dominated space, like hip hop, even behind the scenes, you mm -hmm. are somewhat fearful at times to speak up 
Right, right, yeah. Like, I don't like this. I actually feel uncomfortable even touching my shoulder. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and by you being successful in this field, I really wanted to know how do you navigate in spaces like that that make you feel uncomfortable, you know? Right. I guess, yeah, hip hop, and specifically, like, the music industry is just so casual and, um, uh, like, in that span over the years, like, it's, we're in, in environments where we're at listening sessions at clubs, you know, and I would be at, you know, like in closed studios and, you know, spaces where it's um, just you and the artist or it's just mm -hmm. you and like two other guys or something. Um, luckily, like I haven't, you know, been, um, you know, involved in anything that was, um, that right. was like questionable. Was that? Like you didn't, you weren't in anything as far as like Me Too related nothing that was kind of like questionable like during an interview um like it's those more so little microaggressions and like the yeah. little kind of comments or kind of um you know just like sexist uh, sexist comment or something like when when the uh like the woman is in the room or whatever um or just not kind of like respecting like space or something but for the most part I try to be um you know, I really just treated a lot of it like a job and, um, and I was like, you know, like I would, it's, it's, it's just such a, like an intimate industry. Like we, you know, being in a studio with someone, um, or being able to like go to their house and like inter do an interview, like that's, um, you know, it's just a comfortable environment that is created and that's tough, especially also when you're, when you actually admire the artist that you're talking to or you're, you have a, um, like, you know, you have this like music relationship with them. Right. You know, have that. I interviewed um, like Usher in LA for a Vibe cover story um, around the time of, it was like one of his later albums. Um, and like, I had been a huge Usher fan. Like I, he was my, the first concert I went to and he was like, you know, I was like obsessed with him and, you know, as an artist and, but I was there as a journalist and as a writer and, um, you know, so I kind of, I was just like, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it was hard to like contain, like, I guess like the excitement about interviewing him, but, um, you know, I had to kind of just go in and like do the job and like, you know, get through it. Um, and it was just a, it was like a great experience um, having done that. But yeah, we're in those environments a lot where we're actually fans of these guys. And, you know, it becomes like a really interesting, like dynamic. Um, some like, uh, I did a like clubhouse with Kim Azario like last week um, and Aaliyah uh, King Neal, you know, like both like long, you know, like writing veterans in hip hop and you know, we, we kind of turned it, the conversation turned to that. And, you know, it, it's a good, like Kim has a great perspective on it. Like, you know, just about, um, you know, people expect women to just have like a certain decorum in those um, situations where we're, you know, talking to, you know, someone we might be attracted to. Um, but it's kind of like, if you have that boundary or if you have that, like, all right, this is work and the work is done. And now like I can do whatever I want. I'm like a woman and like I can, you know, if I'm attracted, like what, you know, and I want, and I actually want to have some kind of, um, you know, like interaction, then, you know, I, it shouldn't be like some stigma attached to it or whatever. And so, um, so that was like a really good conversation about just that, how that becomes, you know, it's so easy to just become labeled if, you know, you're in, you are in that environment and something happens and you know but then why does that happen with us and not like you know guys who like a manager who might be dating his artist or something you know or you know uh that type of situation so it's really um i think the conversation has kind of like evolved and stuff but um yeah i was luckily never involved in any kind of you know like crazy situation <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the double standard of it all. That's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Double standards. It's like yeah. girl date a guy that she works closely with because we're all in this industry, then she's considered a whore or she effed her way to the top, which is my worst. It's the worst. And I had a mm -hmm. conversation with Kim Azario about that. Mm -hmm. you know? right, and it's right. a double standard with a guy. It's just like, all right, man. You hit that. Yeah. What's up? You know what I mean? Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, nobody uses like fuck your way to the top with guys because <laughs> that is it's a reflection of how 
the system is even set up. Like the guys are at the top. So, and you know, people think about it more so like not a problem with the system, but like there's like the woman gets some shame or whatever attached to her. So yeah, it's, um, there, there was, I mean, I definitely like knew there was a lot of that um, stigma or like that kind of um, expectations for, you know, for like women uh, and that was like unfair basically. And I think that's across the board, like artists, and writers and, you know. And I don't know if it's the case for you, but it was definitely the case for me. It instilled so much fear in me to the point that I never wanted to date anybody in the industry. And it seems like I'm kind of hearing that from you too. Kim was a total right. opposite in that. I know she talked about, you know, having dealt with Nas and et cetera. Like we talked about that. And I guess it's written, funny wordplay, a wordplay on words, <laughs> that, you know, she talked about that openly. And, you know, she dealt with the backlash of that. And, and prior to her, there was a lot of people that dealt with that. And I think, just seeing that, hearing those type of, you know, titles pushed out there, those polls, F your way to the top, just made me say, yeah, you cute, I like you, maybe we could date, we're two human beings, you know what I'm saying, that are attracted to, attracted <laughs> to each other, but I'm yeah. just so fearful even having dinner with you because of that. Would yeah, you agree that's the same with you? Yeah, that's the same, like, I kind of was very, I almost, I put down extra boundaries and mm. kind of, you know um you know I definitely like moved like more like you know super professionally um because I didn't want any like perception or whatever and like definitely like looking back on it it's it's not fair like it's you know it's um yeah a lot of like work <laughs> like extra work um because of just how things look or like how you know what is what how what things are supposed to be so yeah i have that um you know that uh precaution like yeah in the same way yep yeah well the good thing i like is what you said as far as like your colleagues and stuff people that you work with um at double excel or whatever um b dot is one of my close friends and i told yeah. him <laughs> And he was so happy. He spoke yeah. so highly of you. And you know, B Dot could be a bit of a shrewd, I feel. So when, he spoke, <laughs> <laughs> when he spoke highly of you, I was like, oh my God, you like her. That's like big. You know, very particular taste. <laughs> like, if you get the B Dot approval, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you got the B Dot stamp. So, you know, that's hard. Um, so, one thing he was telling me about that he really enjoyed as far as your work, um, he said, you went viral before viral was even, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the DMX interview that you did, where you asked them about Barack Obama and he had no clue about who Barack yeah. Obama was. Tell me about that experience. <laughs> yeah, I still think about that and like how he had to know, either he knew and he like forgot or something, or it was like, <laughs> the name he was like went I don't know like DMX is a very like uh um interesting person to like interview and like just fascinating I was also obsessed with him when I was younger like I like that was the I think like the first album I downloaded on like Napster it was like it's dark and hell is hot and I had like a huge like poster like the cover of that album like in my uh bedroom when I was younger I had you know I was, I bought like all his albums and, you know, like, so when I got a chance to like interview him, it was just, the man reflected, like, he's the same, like, as he is on the records, like in interviews, like, that's just him. He doesn't change anything. <laughs> and, you know, that, so when I interviewed him, yeah, it was for it, like Double XL, um, like online and, you know, blogs but at that time were really just popping like just starting to kind of, um, you know, that was like Crank Tastical and Nicole Bitchy and, you know, like double XL blogs were like getting out there. And um, so I was doing kind of like, um, you know, for the website, you know, it was just starting to kind of, um, you know, build this content where it's more than just uh, like news stories so trying to do, you know, interviews and all that. And uh, yeah, I interviewed him and <laughs> yeah, he, at one point, yeah, I, br I brought up Barack, um, and he was like, "What? What is a Barack? Like, what? Like, what? Are, who? Who is that? Who are you talking about?" And that went like viral because like DMX doesn't know who Barack Obama is. <laughs> and um, another thing with him was like, 
I mean, I think that was either before or after I flew all the way out to Chicago to interview him. And he just never showed up to the interview. Like I went to the hotel. I was, you know, had met his, I guess his manager or something. And they were like, yeah, he's not coming. <laughs> like, I guess he uh, well, no, no call never. to the show. <laughs> but that was apparently a thing at that time. Like it was like, is he going to show up? Like it was his, it was, like his MO was like, just, just like ducking you on interviews entirely. And so, um, <laughs> DMX, yeah, he will hold a special place like <laughs> my heart. Uh, for yeah, the reason, first yeah. make it go viral, I, and I read the transcript. It was like, oh, he's <laughs> black. He's going for president. No fucking way. Are you fucking kidding me? Like I was. Like, <laughs> That's exactly the voice that it was in. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want to talk about this book, Mother Load, a hundred plus yeah. women who made hip hop. Show, shout it out, shout it out, Al. First of all, our cover is beautiful. We're going to get into the illustration and all that. But I need to know, what sparked that idea? What made you want to do this book? Um, I mean, I felt like it was a story that, um, that I felt that I could kind of like fill in the stories. Like I like kind of telling stories where I'm like filling a gap and not kind of telling the same story over. And this was a way in which I could, um, you know, provide like another lens into what the what you know the story of hip-hop is because you know you like we hear it a lot like one way um and i really just wanted to you know how um you know like in a movie or something or in a in a show they'll show like one person's perspective of like how something happened one character and then it's like you know the second act is like all right here's that second person someone else's perspective and it's like a totally different story and um you know i wanted to do that basically like act one you know, for the most part told about Herc, uh, you know, being the father of hip hop and, you know, um, Rapper's Delight and there, you know, w women like Kim and Foxy and Missy peppered in, but I was kind of like, there are so many other faces or like people that I grew up on, like Soleil and, you know, people like that. So I wanted to, you know, reach out to them and really like kind of tell fill in that um, gap of information basically and give like the act two is well, here's the other, another side of the story that is different from what you, you know, have been told. And, you know, and it's like the women's perspective, like the girl growing up in hip hop, like what was she feeling? And, like, what was she going through? And then what kind of music was she making like as a result of all of that? And so that, you know, I just really wanted to kind of like, you know, I was a, like, we're both, you know, like we were, we grew up girls in hip hop and it's a different, um, it's a different like perspective and a different kind of, you know, um, uh, focus or lens that we bring compared to like just a boy kind of growing up loving Nas and Biggie and all that. Like we have a, you know, more uh, nuance to it because we have to also think about like Biggie's, uh, you know, um, you know, relationship with Kim and like how, how she was, you know, felt how she was affected by that. And like, the, we just kind of think more like mm -hmm. deeply in that way. So I wanted to bring that to the, you know, like to the book and have people, you know, like just see a fuller picture. So true. I never even thought about it like that, but I'm, I know, I guess, you know, unknowingly just listening to Kim, like you said, and knowing her relationship with Biggie and knowing like how he ushered her in into, into right. the culture and listening to her music, I felt it was kind of, I, I would listen to her and, and think, oh, she's talking about Biggie or this, yeah. or like she's going through this with Biggie right now. And this, you know, is reflective of her life and us. Uh, so yeah. true. And if we were dealing with someone similar or something, like a boy I dated who was like, you know, like then now I'm kind of like thinking about you know, we just have a different thought process, you know, like I'm thinking about then like seeing Biggie, you know, being with Faith and then like Charlie Baltimore, who's also in the book and talks about her relationship with him, um, like in the book. And so, you know, we just have a different like interests, you know, it, like we're looking at it from different angles, basically. It's I think deeper for probably. us. Shit, they yeah. got new <laughs> talking about some bitches ain't shit, the mm -hmm. hoes, the tricks, doggy style, which is like one of my favorite albums. But you know, it was just more- yeah. It probably wasn't as deep <laughs> as far as in that um, era of hip hop around that time in the early. Because yeah. when we're listening to that Snoop, we're thinking about the other side of it, like 
all right, well, what, why are you calling her the bitch? Is it because she, or a hoe, because she wants to have sex? And like, we're like, well, what's wrong with that? So, you know, like, it's like, we, we're, I feel like it's just like, we ask more questions maybe. And I know, you know, obviously, like, I'm going to be biased, but um, I just really think that bringing, it's the same as like how like Black women can have a different perspective on, you know, because we are live in all these realities, you know, like the same now when you think about where black women in hip hop, we have that perspective of being young black girls growing up in America, growing up in hip hop, which reflects some of America's misogyny and like patriarchy. So we're just in so many different realities, like at the same time. So I think that's what makes like just rapping, like women rappers even like unique because they're just no nobody has that perspective like nobody else in any other genre like it's a young most for the most part like a young black woman rap using hip-hop um to kind of like tell a story about herself her um ex her, her uh creative expression her sexuality and also and also like her blackness like in america and all these different kind of things coming together and so there's just no other, you know, kind of perspective that really, there's no other kind of uh, type of person that gives you that perspective, like a Black female rapper, like in hip hop. You know? Yeah, totally. And that's why I need to finish my book and writing my book, 48 Hours. Because <laughs> it very much is that, is to talk about, you know, our experiences as Black women coming up through the lands of hip hop. So, mm -hmm. and why the show is like unique. Yeah, yeah. And so when it comes to women in hip hop, who would you say had the most effect in your life? Um, effect. Hmm. Influence, impact that really struck a chord with you coming into this culture. You'd like, yeah, she spoke to me the most. Um, in terms of like who spoke to me, um, I mean, I think, I think Missy, I mean, I always kind of cite Lil' Kim as, you know, this, real like figure um i just she was kind of like one of the first um rappers one and then one of the first women who like just kind of appealed to me music wise visually um i was just so interested in like what and and her story like i was really interested in like what made her want to get into rap and like and i was interested in her insecurities because you know i was feeling the same insecurity like as a girl loving hip-hop and being dark skin and being like feeling like I wasn't you know you know like the ideal kind of like look or whatever so I just kind of felt some of that through her I think and felt like her um you know also wanting to kind of express her herself and like her show you know like express her sex sexuality or like you know but then also being uh, pushed in that direction from people you know I really just she was just such a um, like I think a compass in hip hop and um, like I be, like me coming up like hearing her music as a teenager I think I just you know as I was um, discovering like my own sexuality or discovering myself and like it was just you know in tandem with like hardcore you know and that you know the all the outfits and like the you know it was also like fantasy because you know you want to be with that huge fur coat and she's like coming down the escalator and I'm like yes <laughs> that's like so like yes yeah, as aspirational and she's like yeah doing her little dance and <laughs> with Poppy is like behind her and you know so that was like, it was it was just like a cool image and I know it's you know complicated and all this um there's there's a lot you know of um there were just like so many so many like expectations that I realized through her, that there were, you know, was expected to kind of be a certain way and look, you know, like as like young black women not talk about sex or, you know, so I think she, for me, was like a really um, transformative artist. Um, and then as far as creativity, like Missy, because Missy was just like out of this world and I wanted to, like I wanted like her sense of creativity and her sense of um like just like 
fantasy and all that. Uh, it was just, it was, you know, it, like watching her videos just made me want to be creative, basically. It's like, okay, it's a whole can, how can I tap into like my creativity in a missy way? <laughs> yeah. When you say fantasy, that's like the best description to give when it comes to Missy and, and right. her videos and her music and like everything that she conveyed was just so otherworldly type. Otherworldly, yeah, yeah. Otherworldly. Um, do you have a favorite hip hop song that speaks to your soul? <laughs> by, by like a female rapper? Yes. Um, or actually, you know, it doesn't have to be, but I. You know, <laughs> so I would love you to go look through your book, look through your book. <laughs> you got it right there in front of you, reference it. No, but give me both. Give me, you know, from a man and from a woman. Oh, man. Um... And no pressure, you know, let me put a disclaimer. This is no big deal. <laughs> Clover said my song was her favorite. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. right. <laughs> I hold you to it. Um, I mean, I did, um, like, in <laughs> in researching this book and in writing it, because the, the, the title is from Yo-Yo's album, like, Make Way for the Motherload. And I went back to that album and really just um, re newly appreciated, like, her, like, stance and, like, her... Um, like her music. And so, uh, can't play, you can't play with my Yo-Yo. Like, I played that so many times and just the um you know the same way like when we hear that like living single theme song <laughs> so it's so like kind of like jazzy and it's like you know living single and when i hear that you can't play with my yo-yo and that kind of like that like you know the sax and like the like her attitude on that song i really i was like so re i just like re-remember it i guess like her what she brought and how she kind of, you know, she was like saying something so important. Like I'm in charge of my agency. Like I have agency and like, I'm the, you know, like you can't, you can't like mess with me. Like, you know, like it's, it's just um, like her setting the rules or like hers kind of like laying, laying the kind of like expectation down versus, um, playing into expectations like it was like I would I would pick that song um and that was part of why I just felt like you know the mother mother load was like the perfect title yeah and that song was just um it just makes you feel you know it's just like you can just like instantly feel like the confident message and the yeah like just coolness of that song so that um I <laughs> uh yeah let me let me go back to that i just okay. i could take no yo yo was good now looking at you i feel like every time i see you now i'm gonna hear that song that's like your backdrop <laughs> your theme music don't try to play me out don't try to play me out <laughs> right exactly yeah. Black Queen. yes okay that's good that's good i'm um, thank you for also letting the people know that that's where the title came from from the book mm -hmm. um yo yo which i did knew that but it's great to share oh the other one i was thinking of was like you and i ty i don't know if that's like too <laughs> <laughs> I love that song yeah yeah you and i ty <laughs> it's just such a classic yeah that is yeah. my shout out to Queer Latifah. Now, when you say yo yo, you know, I, I always felt like shout out to Key Lolo. She was great in Martin and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always felt like her rap career, though, was kind of short lived. You know, I feel like I wanted more from yo yo. Um, yeah. And for me, I was asked this question in an interview like, who am I surprised that didn't go further that I thought I had it mm -hmm. in the bag? And for me, it was Vita. I really thought. Yeah. yeah. I really thought, I don't know, I thought she had it. I just thought she was an all-around superstar, the way she looked, mm -hmm. the way she dressed, the way she talked, her acting skills. She was great in Belly. She was great in, was it, uh, Method Man's videos and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But she was she was just a star to me. Um, who was it for you that you felt um, could have went further, that mm -hmm. was a bit? That's a good one. I had not even, and she's, in, I had spoken to her for the book, like, so she's in it, and she yeah she never even got to put out like her album under like murder inc when murder inc was like at the top and really killing it and it's kind of like you know 
she had that voice and like that she was you know on every she is on every like job role hit um or like you know not every but she's right. a role play the role in like his hits and like that whole era where they were basically like unstoppable so that is that is a good one and that also makes me think of um like uh one i hadn't mentioned is like charlie baltimore um and you know she also like wasn't able to put out that her debut album in the same um like in the i think it eventually came out as like a like a mixtape or something like that but she you know it got shelved and just kind of fell through the cracks and she was one who her voice like her presence um i think she got kind of um like because it was the whole biggie um you know like uh relationship or kind of um you know like she kind of got uh typecast in a way like where it was like oh like that's that's like biggie's girl or whatever and i feel like people just couldn't see her seriously as a rapper but she could really like rap <laughs> and you know she was like if she was given a chance to just kind of do her thing on an album um where she could kind of like get good production and kind of um really do it her way i think yeah. i would have liked to see that and seen her which is like you know go go out go go all out and also like visually she could have you know she been, like music videos and yeah you know like that money video was like <laughs> like so much i think it was like actually a high budget video um that she did but you know she didn't do like music videos and didn't get that chance so she's one that i think about like i would have loved to see her put out something you know that was like really just her like, you know, spinning. I agree. She's a great one. Now that you're talking about it, you know, both of them, my Vita with you, with Charlie Baltimore, both were yeah. at one point on the biggest label in the world that was running right. things. Um, and I think with Charlie Baltimore, you know, just not getting the respect and maybe it had a lot to do with just maybe her relationship with Biggie, which is so crazy. Yeah. Like we talked about that earlier. And I will say, now that I think about it, you know, as far as I'm not taking her seriously, Little Kill played a huge part in that, talking about some coming <laughs> to the game on some modeling shit. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> now that I think about it, it was like, yeah, I don't think, even for me, because I'm Little Kim is my favorite, you know, and I was just like, oh, Charlie's coming in his game or something, you know, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's sad as one of those situations, but now that I'm an adult and grown, I realize, you know, the influence that, you know, Charlie could have had even more, you know, mm -hmm. in his culture, and she was super duper talented. When you were doing these stories, because from what I understand, I can't wait to get it, it's coming tomorrow. You're like a historian into this, you know, game. Like you really dig deep. And I love good journalism. I feel like we're missing that. No one's really doing that research. No one's bringing integrity and honesty to the craft anymore. It's just all about clickbait and, mm -hmm. you know, just messy shit, gossip and all that, you know, and I feel like you're standing in substance. So thank you for mm -hmm. your, for your work. And I love that. Um, mm -hmm. When you were doing this as an author, did you find yourself getting upset? listening to these women's stories. <laughs> no, because I, when I right. hear these women and they tell me some of the things they had to go through, you know, behind right. the scenes, it's like, I would just be like, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of like disappointment or like kind of retroactive disappointment where it's like, ah, I can't even do anything now. And yeah, like even hearing from, um, you know, like Mia X talking about like how people would tell her like, you know, kind of like subtly to um that she needed to like look a certain way or look thinner or kind of like oh like maybe you should try this diet or maybe you should try this new thing and how she had to kind of like deal with that um and then when you when i hear it kind of like back to back kind of like some of the same issues of feeling like they weren't getting attention on the label or like you said like being on the hottest label at the time and not even being able to put out an album i think today would sort of be like unheard of because it's just so easy to kind of like even just put out like put something out on soundcloud or whatever you know like it's um to not have been to just kind of be like sitting around and not put something out because uh maybe because people didn't know how to market them or you know if they couldn't figure out what lane they were in if they were somewhere between like sexy and like conscious or it's like, oh, well, which one are you? <laughs> like you can't be both. So 
like it's you know like a lot I did kind of like like those feelings that kind of like rose up like you know um like I just wish things were different or what you know you, you think of like what ifs you know if if Vita had come out and you know it would just the story of hip-hop would be different like we would have more like albums um that were seminal and like considered maybe classics uh by women or um you know just have more kind of like stories at the center so yeah it did <laughs> it was hard to you know be the i guess like a proxy for all this um uh, like their um frustration yeah because you know i'm sure it was hard for them too to kind of like talk about have to talk about like oh yeah i got in you know just kind of i didn't get to my chance to kind of like get you know and get that out at um a crucial time in hip-hop because you know a lot of this was when it was you know nine mid 90s hip-hop becoming huge yeah. and you know um like vita murder inc being like the biggest thing on the planet and shanti being at the top of the charts all the time yeah. <laughs> you know and she and you know that album just kind of fell through so yeah it was um yeah it's like <laughs> no no but i feel like your book can serve as can serve as a um redemption story for a lot mm -hmm. of people, you know to kind mm -hmm. of right. you know, did you feel that way in a sense kind of giving them that chance to you know redeem themselves in a way or or more so like validated after or, you know? Right. Validate is a good, good word too. Like at, more so after the fact, like as I was researching, I didn't really think of it being um, a place for that. But when it was done and kind of the more I talked to people who, you know, um, say that this is a good uh, way, way to, for them to live on, basically. I think that is, yeah, I do think it's a great um, kind of, um, yeah, like it's resource basically to to be able to tell their stories and for you know like an avenue where they not only just tell their stories but have it live together with other women's stories and you know like have it be part of this like fabric um, or you know like a quilt or you know patchwork of kind of um, important moments in hip hop and be in one place. I do think, yeah, it's, it's it's a good kind of like redemption arc, <laughs> I guess. Like, all right, here's here's a place where you can like be seen, you know. We love it. I love it. Thank you for it. Can't wait to read it. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I was going to say, well, in your own words, I guess, because for me, when Women in Hip Hop podcast, I always tell people the biggest misconception is, oh, you got to love the culture. You got to know the culture. You got to know the music. You got to know the artists. That's not necessarily the case. I tell women, especially women and black women, that regardless of what you do, you could be a police officer, lawyer, doctor, et cetera, accountant, I do not care. But these women's stories is going to be relatable to you because they've been through so much. They overcame so much. So you don't have to be a fan of theirs or the hip hop culture, but listen to their stories and you can't tell me that you can't relate. So mm -hmm. that's the biggest takeaway that I want people to take away from my podcast. What's the biggest mm -hmm. takeaway you want people to take away from your book, Mother Mo, 100 plus? Yeah, years? that's that's a great point. And um, I think similarly, like I, I want that also. And then also um, to know that like these women were creating an entire culture and some of them feel like they don't get recognition for it. Um, and that that when you like create something it's like you know like you something that you i don't know imagine like ghost writing something and it just like t is like huge and but no one knows that you kind of like made it or like wrote that thing and it's you know you love having worked on it and you love kind of um being part of it and creating this thing but then it's you do want you know like your legacy or whatever to kind of uh you want your creativity to kind of be um, respected and seen and you know there's that whole Oprah uh, quote that I remember like for where she's like all anyone ever wants is to like be seen and like heard and to know that like I hear you and I see you basically and I think that's really what like all some of them want is for people to be like I see you and like I hear you and like I, I uh, you know 
I see your story and I respect your story. And, you know, I, that's what I kind of want from, from people reading it to just really either see these women who they don't maybe like don't know or haven't heard of, or for the ones that they are familiar with, just kind of see them in a new light or see them in a more like, um, like see them in a, in a space where it's like, oh, I, like they created this thing that I love. <laughs> you know, like they, like Queen Latifah created hip hop, you know, Lil' Kim created hip hop. Like all you, you can say that and, and like it's, it can be like acknowledged basically. Like that's kind of what I want. These, these are the creators of hip hop. 